The following recording is a presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Rohnert Park, California, and of Pastor Val Mark Smith. We are an independent Baptist congregation committed to the accurate presentation of the historical doctrines of the faith. We welcome you to visit our services anytime here in the Rohnert Park area. I'd like you to open to Mark chapter 3. Uh, today we'll look at the same verses that we looked at last week, only we're going to pivot to the end of this section uh, these few verses, and we'll go into a different discussion, um, a conversation, a, a conversation here about two of the most unusual verses in the Bible. When I decided on the title of the message, I looked at it several times, and I felt like it was so out of keeping with what we normally say. It just seems kind of unnatural to say never forgiveness. Several weeks ago when we were studying the second chapter and talking about Matthew, uh, the Matthew the tax traitor, one that most people in that day would have considered to be the worst of all the sinners because he had turned his back on his own people to collect taxes for Rome. I was thinking about that and one of the main points that I stressed was that God will forgive all of our sins when we come in faith, by faith in Jesus Christ. And then I made the point at that time that there's never too great a sinner that God can't forgive. That the suffering, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is big enough, valuable enough, to take care of all of our sins. And the grace of God is always abounding to the sinner who trusts Him. And yet, these two verses that we'll study seem contrary to that teaching. My title needs much more added to it to qualify it, to see the ins and the outs and the, the know, know the hows and the whys and under what circumstances is there never forgiveness. So we go to the scriptures. You're familiar with these. We read them several times. Uh, this will end our study of the chapter because we've already considered verses 20 and 21 along with verses 31 through 35. So we will end our study of Mark 3 today. I want to begin reading with verse number 22. Verse 22 of Mark 3. And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. And he called them unto him, and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sin shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation, because they said he hath an unclean spirit. I'm sure that there have been some messages that I've preached here in the Gospel of Mark, and at other times probably, most likely, messages that you didn't care a whole lot about. But you didn't think too much of them. They weren't uh, all that interesting to you. And when I'm studying the scriptures, um, I sometimes get the, get the same feeling. Why, why do I need to spend time with this? Uh, you may think, why don't we just move on to something else? Let's just be quick about this, get it over with, and go on to something else. But I always discover this, that uh, almost all the time, that when I go ahead and preach that message, I find there will be someone who will meet me at the door and say, I'm glad you talked about that today. It's something that I've been wondering about, and uh, you've explained it, and now, now I understand it. And I'm always happy when someone comes to me and tells me that they have a better understanding of the Word of God because of something that I preached on that day. Uh, and this is, this is what I'm here for. Uh, since the Bible is our only resource material, I do want you to understand it. And if you don't understand something that I say, I'm always available for, for more discussion about it to try to help you to reach understanding. As we look at 
today's topic, I, I think there's hardly anyone uh, who reads the Bible that doesn't find this an interesting topic. The title of my message even strikes a chord of, of uh, curiosity because it seems incongruous with what we know about God. The title, Never Forgiveness, doesn't seem quite right because we are quite sure that God is a forgiving God. God is in the business of forgiving people. A little over 10 years ago, we had a, a banner next to the sign out front of the church. And I don't know if you remember, but the sign said, Church Without Smoke and Mirrors. And I took a survey of, of that just to see what people thought that saying meant. And I got a lot of different answers. And there was one that said this, the meaning of this slogan is a church without judgment on the sins and transgressions of others. And that, I wondered at that, how did that person make that kind of connection with that saying? Uh, so I don't know exactly what they meant, but I will say this, that we are a church that preaches from the Bible. And the Bible is very clear about what sin is. And it is very clear about the consequences of sin. We constantly make judgments about sin. And we must. Because we have the responsibility uh, to name sin. And help people when they're in the clutches of it. And try to get free from it. We, we are to teach about it. The Apostle John defines sin as the transgression of the law. And it is the transgression of God's written law and also those laws that are written on the human heart. And there are consequences to sin. And the Bible gives us the ability to judge. And so we preach against sin. We warn people of the consequences of it. And when necessary, I don't mind at all naming specific sins. But at the same time, we're also quick to point out that God is willing to forgive people of sin. All of us are sinners. And anyone who confesses and repents of his sin and trusts in Jesus Christ to save them from their sin, God will forgive. And if God forgives, we certainly don't hold ourselves above God and say that we will not forgive. And then I'll hasten to add that what you did in the past doesn't matter. At least it doesn't matter in the sense of God's forgiveness. No matter what you've done, no matter where you may have been, no matter how awful your sins are, if you confess them and forsake them, God will forgive. And that's the key always. Confession, repentance, faith in Jesus Christ, and without those, there is no forgiveness. So I think it's very clear that the Bible teaches that God is a forgiving God. He does forgive sin, and the Holy Spirit fills the Bible with many passages about God's forgiveness. Adam sinned and his sin plunged the entire world into the darkness of the curse but God forgave him Abraham that great patriarch of God sinned and God forgave him and then following Abraham along comes uh, Jacob a grandson he sins against God and is forgiven in the judges that was a terrible time of sin in Israel and God forgave in the kingdom of Israel there were times when the sins of Israel were so heinous that they sacrificed their own children to heathen idols. And we just read a passage in Ezekiel a moment ago, Ezekiel 37, that shows that God's going to forgive all of that and bring Israel back and reunite them. Our God is a forgiving God. And God made this promise to Solomon in view of all of these things that God knew that Israel would get into. And he says to Solomon, uh, or Solomon, as he's praying, says this in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. We see many wicked, heinous sins committed. Idolatry, idolatry, murder, adultery, homosexuality, drunkenness, lying, extortion, you name them all. And there are people who did those sins and God forgave when they repented of them. And this is where I, I think sincerely about 1 Corinthians 6 that we read just a moment ago. 
I, I read that without much comment, but I want you to turn there and read it again with me. Uh, this is a good passage to circle in your Bible. And when we are too quick to condemn others because of their sin, when we think that there's just no salvation for them, this is a good place for us to read. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 6, beginning in verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. And I'll stop here just briefly to remind you that effeminate and abusers of themselves with mankind refer to homosexual acts and just about everything or everything that is involved in the entire LBGTQ plus movement. Verse 10, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. These were sins that the Corinthians committed. Paul names them, but they confessed and repented. And Paul says, you are washed from your sins, you are sanctified, and you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. And very simply, he means, you have been forgiven of all these sins. And you are no longer fornicators or idolaters or adulterers and homosexuals and so on. You turned away from those sins and you are forgiven. Now, if anyone tells you, a government official or anyone else says that conversion therapy is wrong, that homosexuals can't change, that God can't fix transgenders, they deny the power of God. God can do that. The sufficient sacrifice of Jesus Christ can cover all of that and change people completely. They blaspheme the name of Christ if they say this can't be done. Well, if you think about it for a minute and think about those sins and what we've just read, what is the worst sin that anyone could commit? What sin do you think is the very worst of all? Well, as I think of it, I can't think of anything worse than crucifying Jesus on the cross. That's a terrible sin. I can think of nothing worse than beating him to a bloody mess, pressing a mocking crown of thorns into his head, driving nails into his hands and his feet, hanging upon the cross naked to be made fun of by the crowd. And in yet such a horrible scene, it was Jesus himself who said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Time after time, in worst-case scenarios, the most heinous of all types of crimes, God says that he will forgive. And so we come to this passage, and it seems an enigma. I mean, it doesn't fit. In one sense, it, it can be most frightening because you may wonder, have I, have I done this? Have I committed this sin? Have I gone this far that I've passed the point of no return? Have I committed this sin that God will not forgive? And that's a very important question. And one, if asked, supplies its own answer. And I'll take that up in just a few minutes and explain to you how. Now let's, let's just back up a moment to consider first the circumstances of the sin that Jesus talks about. Jesus accused the scribes of committing this sin, but what were the circumstances of it? This is important, and we take our time to study so we can very clearly understand the context of these statements. I'm not going to go into it in detail, but in both Matthew and Luke, uh, they supply more information. Now, remember, as we're studying Mark, Mark is a shorter gospel account. It moves very quickly. In a flash, Mark will move from one scene to another, and we don't even assume that each scene is in chronological order. But looking at the circumstance found in Matthew 12 and in Luke 11, this was immediately after Jesus had cast a demon out of a man who was blind and dumb. This was a, a great miracle, and people were astonished that he could do such a thing. And they didn't doubt that it was supernatural. No one claimed that, well, this is sleight of hand. In fact, the miracle was, was so amazing that people posed the question, is this the son of David? Or in other words, could he be the Messiah? Is he the one that we're looking for? 
And at this point, the people weren't enemies of Jesus. They were stood back and wondered in amazement at what he could do. But the scribes and the Pharisees, they certainly were Jesus' enemies. They also knew a miracle happened. And if the people posed this question, could this be the Messiah? Well, they knew right away that they had to do something about it. They had to come up with some kind of an explanation for how he was able to do this. So they posed a theory to explain how he did it. How did he cast out the demon? That's what we studied last week. They said, this he does by the prince of demons. He cast out demons by the power of Satan. Of course, that's a ridiculous assertion. Jesus proved that it was by explaining that Satan is smarter than that. Satan does not cast out demons because it would divide his kingdom. It would have a kingdom in war with itself, and that kingdom could not stand. If it wars internally, it can't stand. And then further, Jesus proved his power over Satan by saying there must be someone more powerful than Satan to bind him. That's who he called the strong man. There must be some more powerful than he is to bind him and then has the liberty to go in and spoil his kingdom. And this is what Jesus did. He cast out the demon because he overpowered Satan. He snatched the man out of Satan's clutches. And this is when Jesus made the charge against them. that They blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. They claimed he cast out the demon by the power of Satan. So the circumstance that we're talking about here is the healing of a demon-possessed blind man. And this sets up the condition that must exist before this sin is committed. Now secondly, we look at the condition for the sin. The condition for the sin is that it was committed in the presence of great miracles that Jesus did. There is the claim that this is not God's work. The scribe says this belongs to Satan. Now understand, this is not the only time that they said this. Uh, this miracle is the one that brought it to a head. There were hundreds of like miracles before Jesus did this one. He went throughout all the towns and villages of Galilee. So there's hardly a town that you would think to mention where some type of miracle wasn't done. None of them were untouched. The religious leaders were always in these crowds and they're always seeing this. They're watching him do the miracles and yet they were stiff-necked and they were hardened in their unbelief. It was beyond reasonable doubt that Jesus came from God and yet in their pride and prejudice against him and their selfish desire to keep control and not to surrender to his authority, they audaciously claimed that his authority came from Satan. This is not the first time they whispered the words. Mark records that they said this before. They said that Jesus had an unclean spirit and he was demon possessed. So Jesus said, you have spoken blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, and you will not be forgiven of this sin. Well, let's take just a moment to talk about blasphemy. What is it? What is blasphemy? We can define it this way. Blasphemy is intentionally and openly speaking evil against the Holy God by defaming and mocking Him. Blasphemy is intentionally and openly speaking evil against the Holy God by defaming and mocking him. Now keep that in mind for just a moment. Keep looking at that. Let me read something that Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Verses 12 and 13. He said, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Paul said, I was a blasphemer, but I have forgiveness. And Paul didn't exaggerate his former life. I mean, he persecuted, he killed Christians. He spoke terrible things about Christ. Well, why was he forgiven? When Jesus said there's never forgiveness for these people. Well, something's different about this type of blasphemy. They refused the testimony of the Holy Spirit proven by signs and miracles. The Holy Spirit testified that Jesus was the King. The Spirit testified that God sent Jesus and He could do these miracles because the Spirit of God was in Him. 
Now that tells us that a specific condition must exist. Jesus must be present in flesh. He healed people and clearly showed the power and authority of God. But these men saw his holy work and they said, this belongs to Satan. This is Satan's work. And they took this holy man and despite all the evidence to the contrary said, he is of the devil. Now notice that Jesus said, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men and blasphemies wherewithsoever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. And then Mark adds a sentence of explanation. He said this because they said he has an unclean spirit. Now that's a perplexing problem to us, isn't it? Is the Holy Spirit more God than Jesus? Is there a difference between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? So there are different degrees of divinity, different degrees of dignity in each. Is the Holy Spirit above Jesus so that if you offend him, it's worse than offending Jesus? Well, the answer to that question is no. And here's one of the keys to understanding what's going on here. Matthew says in greater detail, Jesus said, you can speak against the Son of Man, and you can be forgiven. That's part of the all sins in Mark. Jesus said Son of Man, because that's a reference to him in his humanity. This is the Son of God in his incarnation. This is when he stepped down and purposely put himself in subjection to the Father. Now listen to this interesting little fact about Jesus. Do you know what his first words were recorded in Scripture? We don't have a baby book of Jesus in the New Testament so that we don't find a passage that says, you know, when Jesus was a baby on October the 5th, he said his first word, and it was mama. Well, no, uh, really, we don't have that. We do have his first words recorded in Luke 2.49 when he was 12 years old. Now, I know he spoke long before that, but this is the first thing that's recorded in the Bible. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wished ye not that I must be about my father's business? So his very first words were about his subjection to his heavenly father. And that's important because Jesus is talking about his humanity. He's telling us about his humility. That when he was here in the flesh, you could say anything about him and he would forgive it if you ask forgiveness. And we saw that just a few minutes ago at the cross when he said, Father, forgive them. They did the worst to him, and he still forgave. Now, can you imagine as he was growing up how many times his brothers razzed him about his perfection? Mama never says he does anything wrong. He's always just a good boy. That's all Mama ever says about him. He's a good boy. Can you imagine how many times that just irritated them and how... Uh, and, and, and how they must have pulled pranks on him because of that, trying to get him to do something, say something wrong. Probably happened all the time. It's because his brothers didn't believe in him either. They didn't believe the miracles that he did, and they didn't, as we studied earlier. They didn't believe until after he arose from the grave. But we get their feeling about him as we studied in verses 20 and 21 and verses 31 through 35 of this chapter. So this is Jesus in the flesh, veiled, he veiled his glory. He took on the flesh of men, and for them to commit a sin against him, when he hid his majesty and the glory of God in human flesh, that kind of sin was pardonable. That was done all of the time. That was pardonable. Now suppose for a minute that Jesus didn't veil his glory. Suppose that as the second person of the Trinity, he completely unveiled himself, making it possible to see him in the full blaze of his glory. What would happen? Well, first, you couldn't stand that glory. You probably would be vaporized instantly, but it would mean certainly your death if you could see God, see Jesus Christ in that glory. But suppose for a moment that you looked at him in the face of his glory, and you said, you aren't God. You're from the pit of hell. What do you think would happen then? What would happen? Do you think God would say, oh, that's okay. That's not a problem. I know you're mistaken. You're, you're kind of mixed up about things. That, that'll be okay. 
No, if you think so, you need to read the back of the book. And there you'll find people in the tribulation after this age that, that blaspheme him. And when the king comes in his glory, he seals their doom in hell. So this dichotomy between Jesus and the Holy Spirit shouldn't shake us up. The difference is Jesus in his incarnation versus the Holy Spirit in his full deity. So Jesus is not this, not blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. There is never forgiveness. And do you know why? Because the person who does this does not seek repentance. The person who does this doesn't care. He is so hardened that even in the face of great miracles, he doesn't seek forgiveness. He has hardness of heart that the scriptures call a heart of stone. And here's another fact for you. Why do people repent of their sins? Why do they do it? Well, in Acts chapter 11, the apostle said, it is God that grants repentance. God gives repentance. And this is the problem here. These people are so willfully stubborn that they would not give God the glory for his work. They, they threw the Holy Spirit into the mud in the face of what God was clearly doing and they would not repent because God would not give them that repentance. And this is when there's never forgiveness. If there's no repentance, God can't forgive. To forgive without acknowledgement of sin against the holy God violates God's holiness and justice. And this is something that everybody needs to be aware of. That if you have repented and you believed and you have forgiveness, all of that is God's work. You may have said, I repent. I confess. I believe. But if you did, it's because God already worked in your heart. Now, let's roll back a little to something I said earlier. What if you ask the question, have I committed the unpardonable sin? Have I done this? Is there forgiveness if I ask or no forgiveness? Now, if you ask, your question has its own answer. Anybody that is concerned about this has not committed the sin. If you care to ask, if you care that you might have done this, if you care that you could, then you've not committed a sin. The problem with these people is that they would never ask the question. They were unconcerned about it. They were convinced that Jesus was from Satan and they would never entertain that they committed a gross sin against God. They looked at themselves and they said, we're fine just as we are. And there was never a second thought about it. They would never ask. So if you wonder and you ask, you're not in their condition. You're not in their time. You're not in the place. You're not the, in the disposition they were in. And this is very important because this is a, a, a specific sin. The question is not, did you commit an unpardonable sin? The question is, did you commit the unpardonable sin? And you see, what we can't do is to make more of this sin than the Bible makes of it. This sin is only mentioned three times in the Bible. And all three times are the retelling of this same story. After this, Jesus died and he arose from the dead. And he ascended back to the Father. And there is no more warning about this sin. Paul never said to anybody, watch out. Make sure that you've not committed the unpardonable sin. Peter never said anything about it. Jude never said anything. James didn't say anything. And so if we have this one sin that is so peculiar that if you commit it, God will not forgive you, I think we want to know that. We'd want to know, is this possible for us to do? So we're talking about a specific time, a specific sin for a specific time. It can only happen under certain conditions. Jesus must be in the flesh. He must be doing miracles. And people must be so obstinate in their unbelief that they would say God's work is Satan's work. Now let's take a moment to back up to the beginning of the sermon and talk about number three, the character of God. The character of God. Now I said in the beginning, this scripture is bothersome to us because we know the character of God. We know that God forgives people of sin. When you have the time, check out Leviticus. Long about chapters four and five, somewhere in there, you'll see this. 
you'll see this, it shall be forgiven him. Another sin is mentioned, it shall be forgiven him. And another sin is mentioned, it shall be forgiven him. In Numbers, it shall be forgiven. In Deuteronomy, it shall be forgiven. In the Psalms, blessed is the person whose transgressions are forgiven. In the New Testament, Jesus says over and over, your sins are forgiven. God is a great, big, forgiving God. Now we've moved on now beyond the incarnation of Christ and nobody can commit the unpardonable sin. No one can commit blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So we don't need to be concerned about that now. God is so forgiving that there are two important points that I need to make. The first is the amount of sin does not restrict forgiveness. You'll never reach a limit that if you go beyond the set number of sins, God will not forgive. In fact, our forgiveness of each other is based on the premise that God forgives all sins regardless of the numbers committed. When Jesus taught on this, his response was to Peter's question. This is Matthew 18. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Now that doesn't mean that you calculate, and when you get to 490 sins, you say, that's it. No more forgiveness. No, this is, a, this is a, uh, an expression of limitless forgiveness. And then Jesus went on to give the illustration of a man that owed a large debt that he could never pay, and he received forgiveness. But then someone owned him a much more, owed him a much more manageable debt, and the man would not forgive him. Now the principle is then that God forgave us a mountain of sins, so many sins that it caused the death of his son. And so therefore we are to forgive the transgressions of others that amount to nothing in comparison to what we've done to Christ. So God doesn't concern himself with unpardonable sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us of all sins. And that shows us that the sin in Mark 3 must be so unusual that no one would mention it in any, any ordinary course of conversation about sin. So the amount of sin doesn't restrict forgiveness. Now secondly, the extent of sin does not restrict forgiveness. Well, by extent, I mean sins that are committed to their worst conclusions. For example, there are sins that are committed with great brutality. An example would be uh, uh, murdering someone. Oh, it's a terrible sin to kill someone. Terrible sin against man, against God, against society. But aren't we more enraged if we read of a torturous murder? What if that person burned his victim with cigarettes? What if he slit the person's eyelids? What if he cut off their fingers? Or he pulled out their teeth? Or maybe even worse, cut off a limb while the person's still living? That enrages us. And further, if that is a child, how much worse is it? These are crimes of the worst sort. Every one of us would say that a person who does such things deserves the hottest part of hell. And yet, do you know there are people in prisons that have committed such crimes? And then somebody comes to them, a preacher in the jail or whatever, to the prison, tells them about Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sins, and they repent of their sins and they believe, and they're saved eternally for heaven. Now, they still have to bear the consequences of sins against society, but God forgives them eternally. You say, how can that be? How can God do that? It's because God can save the worst of the worst. Christ's death is far superior to all of that. If it wasn't, then we would begin to judge. We would judge who is worthy of salvation and who is not. We would look at ourselves and we would say, we are more deserving of salvation than that no good for nothing person down the street, that socially unacceptable person, they can't be saved. Oh, the men who crucified Jesus committed the worst crime of all in his torture. And yet, do you know, there are many people who say that the centurion who was in charge of the crucifixion became a Christian when he saw what happened to Jesus on the cross. And he said, truly, this was the Son of God. None of these people committed an unpardonable sin. 
And so when we look for candidates who may have committed the unpardonable sin, where do we find them? Who today has committed a sin that Jesus talks about in Mark 3? We see the worst of the worst in Jesus' day, even the ones who crucified Christ, and any of them could receive forgiveness. Who has done worse? How can we warn people about committing this sin when even Jesus didn't? And yet facing us is the reality of an unpardonable sin. Not the unpardonable sin, but an unpardonable sin. What is this sin? Well, it's not one sin. It's all sins. Every sin is an unpardonable sin if we don't meet certain conditions. Now, folks, understand again, the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is the unpardonable sin. We can't commit that sin today. There was a fellow who uh, wrote a gospel tract that was here when I first became pastor. And this fellow said in his tract, there is only one sin that condemns to hell. It is the sin of unbelief. If you repent of the sin of unbelief and that sin only, you can go to heaven. And I threw those tracts away because that is a misrepresentation of repentance. You must repent of all your sins to go to heaven. Any sin that's unrepented is an unpardonable sin. But here's the thing. You'll not repent of any sin when you're in unbelief. Nobody ever said, well, God, I'm sorry for my sins. I repent. But I don't believe that Jesus died and rose again from the grave and he died for my sins. Nobody ever says that. Repentance and faith are twin graces. You can't have one without the other. Everyone who repents, truly repents, believes. And everyone who believes, truly repents. And if that doesn't happen, then they're not, they can't be saved. Now here's the salient point that I want you to get from this. There is an unpardonable sin, which is chief of all. It's the sin of the rejection of Jesus Christ. It's the sin of turning your back on the one that died for your sins. It's refusing to believe that he is the Christ, the Savior of the world. So you don't concern yourselves with what the scribes said. Well, it's a good thing that I, and you say, it's a good thing I'm not like them. I can't commit that sin, so it's a relief. No, you can't say that when you're still in unbelief. If you die that way, rejecting Jesus Christ, you can lift out the end of verse 29 and apply it to you. You are in danger of eternal damnation. This is not about the possibility of parole. It's emphatic. There is never forgiveness for this sin. Well, there are many people that preach this passage and they say, the unpardonable sin is the sin of unbelief. And you know why that doesn't work? It's because all of us were once in unbelief. Every one of you, before you came to Christ, you were in unbelief. Every unbeliever is in unbelief. And so if you are here today and you have trusted Christ as your Savior, God forgave your unbelief. And the condition was your repentance and faith in Jesus Christ and turning from those sins. Now you're on your way to heaven. So unbelief is an unpardonable sin if you stay that way. If you walk away and you say, I will not believe and you stay that way, there is no forgiveness for your sin. If you slip out into eternity by way of an auto accident or a heart attack or some other illness still in unbelief, you suffer the eternal wrath of God because of your sins. There's a little hope. There's no hope after life if you have not repented, if you die in unbelief. Now, I hope that you understand this. We can tell you about sin. We can judge which things the Bible says are sins. The Bible clearly tells us what they are. It also says that all people are sinners and all people need forgiveness. We can tell you how to receive forgiveness. I can't forgive you of your sins, but I can tell you who can. I know that God forgives. Of that, there is no doubt. Someone once said to me, you don't understand. I have a lot of really bad things in my past. And I said, I don't care about your past. I want to know, what are you going to do right now? When does God not forgive? He does not forgive when you do not believe that Jesus Christ died to save you from your sins. 
that is a right now in the moment condition. Two important scriptures and we finish. Jesus said in John 3, 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. That is right now. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John said in the end of the chapter, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Now please remember this, because he that does not believe, he, she, that does not believe, shall not see life. That is an unpardonable sin. This is when there's never forgiveness. Do you have a question about whether you committed the unpardonable sin? I can satisfy your mind for that forever. Trust Jesus Christ and you'll never need to think about it again. That settles the question for every believer. Blessed be God for Jesus Christ who came to give his life to forgive us of our sins. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the precious word that you've given us uh, the knowledge that Jesus forgives sins based upon the sacrifice that he made on the cross of Calvary, that he paid for all sin. Uh, there is no sin that's too great that people today cannot be forgiven of. And Lord, as we look at the condition of our world today and so many terrible things that go on, and then those who say, we can't be delivered from this, there's no way we can change from this, from what God says is so clearly sin, and they say it can't be done, the Bible says it can be done, it will be done by faith in Jesus Christ. Help us to preach that truth and not be afraid to name sin. And then to put our everlasting hope and confidence our security in the one who forgives sins forever, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for what he did for us. Bless our people. We pray anyone here who might have felt some conviction uh, in the message today, speak to their hearts today. Otherwise, draw us all closer to you because of what we heard. We give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing, please. God of grace, amazing wonder, irresistible and free. Oh, the miracle of mercy, Jesus reaches down to me. God of grace, I stand in wonder, as my God restores my soul. His own blood has paid my ransom, awesome cause to make me whole. God of grace, who loved and knew me long before the world began. Send my Savior down from heaven, perfect God and perfect man. God of grace, I trust in Jesus, I'm accepted as his own. Every day his grace sustains me as I lean on him alone. God of grace, I stand astounded, cleanse, forgiven, and secure. All my fears are now confounded, and my hope is ever sure. God of grace, now crowned in glory, where one day I'll see your face. And forever I'll adore you in your everlasting grace. That was emphatic. We'll say that. Get that truth for sure. Uh, Luke chapter 17 is our benediction today. Uh, verse number 3. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespasses against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostle said unto the Lord, increase our faith. I've read that so many times, and most people would put increase our faith by itself or include it with the next section. And I'm thinking, no, when the apostles heard this, they're used to a system where you don't forgive people like this. I mean, once maybe, second time, slap them across the head. Jesus said, you keep forgiving if they keep asking for forgiveness. And that is modeled on his own example, what he did for us.
So praise God you're here with us today. We thank you for being here. God bless each and every one of you. We do invite you to stay and have lunch with us. And uh, then we'll have our business meeting right after we, we finish eating today. So let's have a word of prayer. And we'll ask God's blessing upon the food. And then we, we'll fellowship together. Father, thank you for this time we've had to spend in your word today. Thank you for your people. And, and then the opportunity we have to fellowship we do thank you for uh, those of uh, the ladies that are in the kitchen now who uh, prepared things for us and made it possible for us to have the luncheon today and for all the folks that brought in food. We thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, for daily provision. Uh, each one of us has to rely upon you for everything that we get and acknowledge that you are the one that gave it. Thank you, Father, for all this. Help us, Lord, to do your will this week as we encounter others and tell them about Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to this presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Roner Park, California. If you would like further information about our church, please feel free to call us at area code 707-584-7275 or write to us at Brian Baptist Church, 6298 Country Club Drive, Roner Park, California, 94928. Additionally, you may visit us online at www.bbaptist.org.